Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another Wednesday. It's Wednesday, November the 10th, November the 10th, year of our Lord, 2021. Welcome to another Wednesday evening virtual Bible study with the New Hope Baptist Church of Covington, Georgia. We're so happy and glad you were able to uh, join with us tonight. We thank God for your viewership. We thank God for you. Uh, those of you who are sharing the videos on your timeline, and we want, to, we want to encourage you to do that. As we always say, if these uh, lessons are a blessing to you, whether it's Wednesday night or Sunday morning, if they're a blessing to you, they'll be a blessing to someone else. So we encourage you to share them on your timeline. You can find uh, the archives of videos we've done in the past on our church Facebook page in the video section and also on my personal YouTube page. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about speaking into the atmosphere. Is this a biblical practice? That's the question we're going to be dealing with tonight. Speaking into the atmosphere. Is this a biblical practice? And so uh, we're excited about the lesson tonight. Hopefully we'll be able to learn some insight that will help us to be better disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, and by way of announcement, we want to just announce um, the church anniversary, our 100 and uh, the 124th year uh, church anniversary. Uh, just going to have an observance, just a small observance during our uh, Sunday morning worship experience on the third Sunday. So I want to keep that in mind. And uh, also, I want to remind you also that the time for the um, Prayer line on Thursday night. We're on, we started, I believe this was last week was the first time out we did this. Uh, the time has been delayed no longer at 7 p.m., but it's at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock until 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the prayer line tomorrow night is uh, from 8 o'clock until 8.30. And let me just uh, put that up there so we can see that. Uh, We'll make sure we know uh, the time. 
Let's see. Let me get this. Yes. Yes. The New Hope Baptist Church prayer line is every Thursday. Uh, we're going to be going from 8 o'clock p.m. until 7. I'm sorry. 8 o'clock until 8.30 p.m. So we're going back an hour. It used to be 7 o'clock. We're going to be at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock until 8.30 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. Everything else is still the same. The number is still the same. 774-220-4020. And the access code is still the same. 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. As we pray tonight, we're remembering uh, Brother T.K. Adams Sr. Brother Adams had a fall the other week. He was hospitalized in Athens. From what I'm understanding now, he's at home recuperating. So we thank God for that. Uh, Brother Adams is at home. We are praying uh, for the family of Pastor W.J. Smith. Pastor Smith was funeralized. I believe that was uh, yesterday, yesterday at Sims Chapel at noon yesterday. And so we're lifting up his family in our prayers. We're also praying for the Annie Terrell family, Terrell family, um, Chandra Price, uh, the lovely wife of Pastor Timothy Price. That was her mother, funeralized also on yesterday. We're praying for the Zebedee Johnson family of Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Deacon Zebedee Johnson of the New Caney Creek Missionary Baptist Church there in South Jackson made his transition. I believe that was Friday. And so we're praying for uh, the Jackson, uh, the Johnson family. We're praying also for the Conaway, the Conaway family. Um, mother and son were killed in an automobile accident uh, a few weeks ago in Jackson. And I believe also that. Uh, Two of the daughters are still in the hospital recuperating. So we're lifting them up in our prayers. Certainly we're lifting up that husband and his father as he deal with this tragic loss in his family. We're also praying for the Colin Powell family. Colin Powell was funeralized. I believe that was last Friday there in Washington, D.C. A lot going on. The COVID-19 virus is still active. We're not out of the woods yet. And I want to encourage you, if you have not, please, ma'am, please, sir, get your vaccine. If you have, I believe they, they booster shots are available now. And so, you know, we're getting ready to get into the flu season, all this kind of thing. And so we don't want to compound problems. So let's do what we can to stop the spread of the virus. We're still continuously praying for our uh, health care workers, the doctors, nurses, Healthcare professionals who've been doing a yeoman's job in dealing with all this sickness, pain, and death. And we're just praying, we're lifting up all those families that have lost a loved one, not just in the United States, but all across the world from this virus. Uh, it is too bad that it became politicized. And I think because of that, there were a lot of people who died who didn't have to die. But nevertheless, we're still lifting up those grieving families. We're lifting up our government officials that God will grant them wisdom to govern not according to their party preference, but govern in a way that will be beneficial and good for the people. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll be ready to start with our lesson for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you even for right now. We thank you, Lord, for watching over us as we went about our daily occupation today. You kept us from all hurt, harm, and danger. And you've enabled us, oh God, to meet together again virtually. And we pray, oh God, for everyone who's watching this video. Uh, this FaceTime live and those who will be watching later on, that you can just meet them at that point of need and bless them, oh God, according to their faith. God, we ask you now that you forgive us of our many sins, our sins of omission, as well as our sins of commission. Help us to be the people you're calling for in these last and evil days. We lift up uh, Brother Adams, God, that you just touch his body, 
uh, that we just be with the medication as he mends and we just lift up also Sister Adam, that we just be with her also in a special way. Not just them, but there are others, oh God, who are sick and stand in the need of prayer. We lift up all the bereaved family, the Smith family, the Terrell family, the Johnson family, the, the Conaway family. Uh, and there are just so many others, oh God, all across this world and all across this nation, God, that have suffered the loss of a loved one. Probably just got, a, got a, a, an announcement, uh, um, an alert on my phone today about a young a young boy that's missing. God, we just pray to God he'll be able to be uh, return home safely. And yes, we we lift up the families of God of the two uh, police officers who were just killed just the other day. We went in, went in Henry one in Henry County and one in Jackson County. God, we just uh, be with their families. God, comfort them. And God, we just praying again uh, for the family of the young man who was shot at the bus stop. We praying for his family. We're also praying for the family of the young man who shot him, God. Lord, our, our young people just need you. Just, Lord, just take hold of the reins of their minds, God, that they may understand that there is value in life. Help them, oh God. The devil desires, uh, just sift them even as we, he desires this generation. And God, we just pray that you would just uh, protect them. Protect them. And then, Lord, help us to be good examples so that they will have a pattern to live by as to be productive, good young men and women. Now, God, give us the spirit of revelation as we seek to study your word tonight. And help us to, to learn all that you have us to learn so that we might be better equipped to represent you and the kingdom. This we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you tonight. Now, as we said earlier, we're going to talk about speaking into the atmosphere. And we're going to deal with the question of whether or not this is a biblical practice. Speaking into the atmosphere. Is this a biblical practice? And uh, I, you hear it a lot in church circles today. And so I want us to look at this tonight because everything that's going on in Christian circles that claims to be of God may not necessarily be of God, may not necessarily be biblically correct or biblically sound. And so it is our intention, it's our goal with these lessons not to nitpick, but to help us to walk according to biblical sound, biblical doctrine and teaching. And so we want to look at this. Speaking into the atmosphere, is this a biblical practice? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to hold you into any mystery. The answer is no. The concept, the idea, uh, the practice of speaking to the atmosphere is not a biblical concept. There's no record of anyone in the Bible speaking into the atmosphere. In fact, until recently, this practice was unheard of in Christian circles. I've been preaching 43 years. Never heard of the concept of speaking to the atmosphere for the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so. Never heard of that. Of course, there's a lot going on in church now that I never heard of, you know, earlier in my ministry. So there's a lot of stuff that's being incorporated into the church, being incorporated into worship, um, that I think is more uh, with uh, modern fads, if you can say that, 
rather than sound biblical teaching. And I think this, this is one of those concepts uh, because it's not a biblical concept. It sounds biblical. It sounds spiritual. Sounds like something we ought to be doing. But it's not a biblical concept. There's no record of anyone in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, just speaking into the atmosphere. So let's let's sell that, you know, that's I'm not gonna hold you in suspense. The answer is no. It's not a biblical concept, not found in the Bible. But not only is it not a biblical concept, this this idea of uh, speaking into the atmosphere is it really comes as uh, from a practice of new age Gnosticism and ancient mysticism. Uh, and it's, it comes from the idea that spoken words have some sort of mystical power to affect change. Now the Bible does say that there's power in our words but that power in our words is backed by faith, is what we believe. And that's all uh, uh, within the parameters of God's will. In other words, no matter how much faith you have, uh, if your faith is not according to the will of God, then it won't happen. It won't happen. I think what is happening in a lot of cases, people have, uh, people don't have faith in God, they have faith in faith. And, and you see, faith is, 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 you gotta have an object of faith. Faith has to be tied to something, something that's true. So, so it's not just a matter of closing your eyes and believing with all your might and things will happen or just saying stuff and believing that what you say is gonna happen. No, your faith has to be tied to the objective truth of God's word. So in addition to, you know, this, this, this came about, um, gained popularity in the word of faith movement. And a lot of things that uh, were going on in the word of faith movement uh, some 20 to 30 years ago, that traditional Christianity label as heretic is being practiced now in traditional uh, church circles. And this is one of those things. I, I think the, it, it really uh, stemmed from Myron Butler's uh, song called Speak. I believe that song came out in, back in 2012. Uh, where he talks about speaking into the atmosphere, and uh, and, and this this is why I am peculiar uh, with with our music ministry at the church, uh, just because you hear a, a song on gospel radio being being played by gospel music stations. That doesn't necessarily mean that that song number one is appropriate for worship. A lot of the songs, some of some of the songs that 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 um, even songs, well, some of the songs that are on Christian radio are okay for Christian radio, but they are not appropriate uh, for Christian wish. So just because a song is is is, is being played, just because the song has popularity, uh, just because other choirs are singing. <laughs> That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a song that needs to be sung in church. And so we need to be, I think we need to be careful. We need to be selective about what we sing. Because number one, we want to make sure what we sing is theologically sound or theologically accurate. And we want to make sure we, what we sing is conducive to worship. So I think this idea of speaking to the atmosphere. Uh, and I've heard, you know, I've heard the song several times with, with him singing. I've heard several church choirs singing. Uh, but it comes from that song, Speak. 
uh, I think that was, um, came out, I believe, I believe that was in 2012. And I just, uh, I found the lyrics online. And he's what, here's what he said. He said, I shall have what I decree. Yes, I believe it belongs to me. I shall have what I decree. Yes, I believe it belongs to me. Speak into the atmosphere. Speak into the atmosphere. And then they say, speak eight times. Declare it eight times. It's mine eight times. Yes, eight times. I shall have what I decree. Yes, I believe it belongs to me. I shall have what I decree. Yes, I believe it belongs to me. Speak into the atmosphere. Speak into the atmosphere. Those are the lyrics of the song uh, by Myron Butler. I believe that song came out in 2012. So let's look at, at this. It has what I would call a pseudo biblical basis. And I'm saying that because, you know, I, I, don't, I don't dare say and I don't think that the person who wrote the song, and even Myron Butler himself, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I doubt if their intentions were malicious or deceptive. I, I don't think they were attempting to mislead people. I think. Uh, they, you know, they, they actually believe that what they're singing is a biblical and valid concept. And most likely, uh, they got that idea uh, from Job 22 and 28. This is probably where it came from. And this is the verse in the King James Version. The verse says, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy way. That's what the verse said. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy way. So let's take a closer look at that verse. Because I say it all the time. You can make the Bible say anything you want to say, want it to say, by merely taking scripture, taking verses out of context. And so we need to look at the context of who spoke this, how we were spoken, who it was spoken to. Number one, the words were not spoken by God. They were spoken by Eliphaz. And Eliphaz was one of the friends of Job. Remember Job in his affliction, his friends came to see about him. And Eliphaz was one of those friends. And he, Eliphaz is the one who spoke these words, thou shalt be free of him. So that's the number one thing we want to be aware of. Uh, just as in that passage in John, where you know we always you hear people quote, well, you know, the Bible says it's God's will that we prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. Number one, God didn't say that. It's part of a salutation, part of a greeting uh, that John gives to Gaius, the recipient of his letter. Actually, not a deep theological statement at all. It's just a wish for his well-being. So that was not something God said. So you need to be aware of that. When you hear people quote scripture, the Bible say God said, well, the Bible does say some things, but you, we need to understand the context of what is being said, how it's being said, who is saying it, who are they saying it to, what are the circumstances surrounding the saying. And in this particular case, with this particular saying thou shalt decree a thing it was not said by god it was said by Eliphaz. He's, 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 he's having a conversation with job now second thing we need to be mindful of is that the hebrew word 
that is translated as declare in Job 22 and 28 is a word that means to make a decision, to decide. In fact, I think most of the modern versions, uh, such as the RSV and maybe the new RSV and ESV, when you read that that particular verse and those verses, they, they probably say something like, you will you shall decide a thing. Okay, because that 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 word that translated English word declare does not mean the declare we we think about today. Because I, I declare this and I declare that. That's not what it's talking about. It's not about speaking. It's talking about making a decision. So the meaning of the word declare in Job 22 and 28 is not the meaning that people have taken it to mean. It's not about speaking as in making a declaration. The word, the Hebrew word literally means to decide. You're going to decide a thing. Okay. In addition, and here's a kicker. If we go down to the end of the book of Job, go to chapter 47, verses 7 and 8, we find that the Lord refuted everything Eliphaz and his friends said to Job. In other words, he look at what you, look at what God says to him. He says, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the, the, the Tenemite, Ten Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your friends, your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. In other words, God is saying to Eliphaz, all this advice you've given to Job, everything you said to Job was a mis, you know, a misrepresentation. So in other words, God is declaring, God is saying what Eliphaz said in Job 22 and 28 as invalid. It was wrong. So there you have it. number one. It was not spoken by God, spoken by Eliphaz. Number two, the word declare in that verse does not have the meaning we make it to mean. It's not talking about speaking a thing. You're really talking about you will decide a thing. And number three, God declared. Uh, God says to Eliphaz, and everything you said was wrong. So he nullifies that statement. So it's three strikes. Okay? Three strikes. So you need to be aware of that when you hear people say this. Now let's look at this idea of speaking into the air. The closest context of anything said in the Bible about speaking to the air or the atmosphere is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 9. This is where Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, discussed the matter of speaking in tongues. What was happening at the church of Corinth, uh, they were infatuated with the gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul, uh, in no uncertain terms, says to them that, number one, speaking in tongues is a gift. Number two, everybody does not have that gift. Uh, and number three, you're putting too much emphasis. In fact, he says that it is one of the lesser gifts. He says, I wish that all would prophesy with understanding rather than speak in tongues. Well, listen to what he says. This is, this, he's talking about the context of speaking in tongues during a worship uh, service or doing an assembly. He says, now brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinctive notes 
how will anyone know what is what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct in, in uh, distinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourself. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. You will be speaking into the atmosphere. The point Paul is making is that if you're going to speak in tongues publicly, and he says this in another, in another place, he says no one ought to be able, no one should speak in tongues publicly unless someone who someone there also has the gift of interpretation. It's amazing to me that today people, you know, even today people want to promote this idea, this gift of speaking in tongues. And this is, you know, you know, you gotta speak in tongues. Yeah? But nobody's talking about the gift of interpretation. And Paul said, the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophet. In other words, this is not something you just can't control. He says, now, if you're gonna, if you're gonna speak in tongues and there's no one there to interpret, he says, be quiet. Don't speak in tongues publicly if there's no one there to interpret. He says, because if you speak in tongues publicly and there's no one there to interpret, there's no one there to understand, there's no one there to benefit from the revelation you've received from God, he said, it's just like speaking into the air. So in the, in the context, Paul actually says in this verse, speaking to the air is useless. Speaking to the atmosphere is useless. It serves no benefit. It serves no good. Of course, now he's talking in the context of tongue. But you know, we're not gonna, that's, that's, that's the only passage we're gonna find in the Bible that even mentions this idea of speaking to the atmosphere. And he, he does that as an aside. He says, you know, if, if, you, if you're talking in tongues, there's no one to interpret it. You know, you just, you're just making noise and it's just like speaking to the air. It's no good. It's just like speaking to the atmosphere. It's no good. Okay? So, and this is, so he has nothing good to say about that. Uh, so, and he definitely does not advocate that as a practice. So what's happening? There's a connection between music and theology. And the problem today in many church circles is the fact that theology, and, and theology, you know, don't let that word scare you. You know, everybody has a theology. The, your theology is, is the theology is merely what and how we think about God and the things of God. But theology is being influenced and often shaped by gospel music instead of gospel music being influenced and shaped by theology. You see, most of the people who write the lyrics of the songs of today's gospel music are not trained in theology. And many of them are not even good Bible students. What happens is that they, 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 they run across a concept, take it out of context, put it into a song, nice rhythm, Nice beat, sun catches on. And before you know it, people saying this is what the Bible says, you know, and they get their theology from their song that they sing. Now, this is not something new. You know, some of the some of the some of the some of the songs uh in our hymnals are not necessarily biblical correct, you know, back written back in the 1800s and whatnot. So we need to be careful. We need to make sure the songs we've seen 
don't just sound good, but they're theologically sound. Now this problem is further compacted. You compound it by there's a lack of sound theological teaching within the church. People, we don't like to go to Sunday school. We don't like Bible class. You know, I, I've noticed as I get the um, get the um, stats on, on on the videos we produce. There, there will always be more people who will watch the Sunday morning worship video than will watch the Wednesday evening teaching video. And I think that's because, you know, we, we, we and it's always been, even before videos, you know, I don't care what church it is, what nationality, what branch of theology or Christian doctrine. Uh, it has always been this way. People will attend worship. More people will attend worship than attend Sunday school. And definitely than will attend Bible class. Now listen, you're going to shout. You're going to have a good time in church. You know, you need to know what you're shouting about. Because if you know what you're shouting about, you'll shout that much more. Our God is an intelligent God. And he wants us to be intelligent when it comes to his word. He wants us to be intelligent when it comes to theology. And he says we need to study. We need to make every effort to make ourselves approved unto God. Workmen that need not be ashamed rightly or correctly dividing, teaching, disseminating the word of truth. And what is happening today, we have a lot of people, even preachers, uh, you know, it's the surprising thing is that preachers, some preachers, uh, you know, even, even craft their sermon, not from biblical theology, but from the songs on the radio. It's, it's amazing. And so within the church, there's a lack of sound theological teaching that equips congregants, that is the people out in the pew, choir directors and choir members with the ability to recognize the theological nonsense. Many of today's gospel songs contain and promote. And this idea of speaking into the atmosphere, you know, it's, 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 it's theological nonsense. It's not biblical. Just because a song sounds good doesn't mean the song is theologically sound. Doesn't mean that's a song we need to be singing. I don't care who, who produces it. I don't care who the recording artist is, how big a following he has. The rule of thumb is what he's singing, is what she's singing, is what they're singing theologically and biblically sound. You're not going to know that unless you know how to study and read the scriptures accurately. All right? So. Uh, somebody may, may be asking, well, what about Mark 11, 21, 24? You know, Jesus says, He said, shall say to the mouth, and be thou removed, be a cast in the sea. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So I talk about, you know, whatever you say. But the context of that also, Jesus has cursed his fig tree. Uh, they were going into Jerusalem, and uh, Jesus was hungry. The Bible says, he looked up and he saw a fig tree afar off. And uh, he went up to it expecting to get some figs. And when he got to the tree, he discovered that there was nothing but leaves. And so Jesus cursed the tree. He said, no man eats two of you hereafter now and forever. 
The next morning, when they're coming back into town, Peter notices that the tree, Jesus cursed, has withered and died, you know, has died and withered up from the roots. So this is where he, this comes in. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it shall be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Let's take a look at that. First of all, we want to notice Jesus said, have faith in God. The Greek literally says, have the faith of God. Have faith in God, not faith in faith. Have faith in God. You see, our faith must be grounded in biblical truth in order for it to be biblical faith. Just because you believe something and you believe long enough, you believe hard enough, that's not faith. That's not going to make it happen. Faith has to have an object. Faith has to have something that it is tied to. And that thing that anchors our faith is the objective truth of God's word. When Jesus said, whoever, whosoever says to this mountain, he was speaking hypothetically about addressing the issue or speaking to the problem. Uh, I think what happens a lot of times even when we pray sometimes, we spend too much time talking to God about our problems. When Jesus said we should talk to our problems about God, speak to the issue, speak to the problem. Now, you're not saying to the issue or saying to the problem, you know, just what you want. You are, you are saying and you're addressing the problem with the word of God. This is why Bible study is so important. The job of the Holy Spirit, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Jesus said that the Spirit would bring to our remembrance the things he said. But listen, if we don't study the word, and we don't study the word of God correctly, we don't read our Bible, we don't spend time in our Bible, then we don't, the Holy Spirit has nothing to work with in our lives. He can't bring to our, remem our remembrance something that we hadn't even learned in the first place. So in order to have an effective prayer life, Bible study is imperative in having an effective prayer life. Many, many people's prayers are not answered, not because they don't have faith, but because their prayers are not biblically sound. They're not biblically accurate. They're not biblically grounded. God is obligated to honor his word. And so when we give God's word back to him in prayer, and then that's one of the keys, along with obedience, along with, you know, confess, you know, confessing our sins. That's one of the prayers. I mean, that's one of the secrets to having our prayers answered. So, but notice here in this, in this particular text, Jesus said, speak to the problem. He said, whosoever shall say to this mountain, he didn't say whosoever shall speak into the atmosphere. He said, whosoever shall say into this mountain. He's not talking about speaking to the atmosphere. He's talking about speaking to your problem, addressing your issue. And then the context is prayer. <clears throat> now, in other places, Jesus made it plain that we are to pray according to the Father's will. Now, his word is his will. So we don't, if we don't know his word, then we don't know his will. A lot of times we, you know, I've heard this, you know, years ago. I don't hear that much now. But years ago, people used to pray and pray. Uh, and 
and they will pray something, and they say something in the prayer, and they say, Father, if it be thy holy will. Uh, for instance, uh, they might say, well, you know, uh, Lord, save, save people if it be thy holy will. That, that's, that's, that, that's, that's a non-biblical prayer. Number one, because it, it is God's will that all men be saved. The Bible says that. Now, all men will not be saved. But it's God's will that all men be saved. So it's, it, it doesn't make sense to, to ask God to save people if it's his will. Because it is his will. So we should know as much as we can the will of God so that we'll be able to, to pray uh, with biblical intelligence and biblical accuracy. So we are to pray according to God's will, not according to our wishes. So let's look at this theological. There's some other theological missteps that I, I want to add to this. I want to piggyback on this idea of speaking to the atmosphere because that's that's the main one I wanted to start off this topic with. But that's not the only one that's uh, going around. Uh, this idea of decreeing and declaring that he mentioned in the song, in addition to speaking to the atmosphere, just just a preliminary exegesis. That word exegesis means that you get out of the text what's in the text. A lot of times we'll get to exegesis. We, we put stuff in the text that's not there, that the author did not intend. Because the meaning of the text is not what we think, not what we, what we believe. The real meaning of the text is what the author intended. And so that's where we want to get to. We want to get to what what did the author in what was his intended meaning when this text was written? And when and and even even though God says to Eliphaz he was wrong in what he said, when he said it, he he wasn't talking about decreeing like we do today, like we use it today. He wasn't even talking about that. Like I said earlier, he was talking about if we were to translate that into modern English. He wouldn't say you shall decree a thing. He would say you shall decide a thing. He wasn't talking about saying out loud like I declare or I decree. He was talking about making a decision. So just a preliminary, you know, I mean, you don't have to go deep, but just a preliminary exegesis, a preliminary study of um, Job 22 and 28 uh, would reveal this idea of decreeing, declaring. Uh, is also not a valid biblical concept. So listen, the only thing that we can decree and declare are the things that God has already decreed and declared. The things God has already said. See, we can only say amen to what God has said. And you can't say amen if you don't know what God has said. By, listen, listen. No matter how you cut it, slice it, or dice it, intelligent, sound, biblical study is imperative for your spiritual growth. It's imperative to learn how to correctly study, read, and interpret the word of God. This idea of speaking to the atmosphere is more akin to ancient mystical uh, magical enchantment than biblical thought and practice. And you know, as I was as I was uh, preparing this lesson, you know, it, the thought ran across my mind that in 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 a lot of church circles today. We use the phrase in the name of Jesus as if it's a magical formula. Like abracadabra or open sesame. But listen, the power is not in saying in the name of Jesus. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting off this a little bit. 
where we are tonight. But I just want to throw this out. This is a freebie. The power is not in saying, you know, you do something and you say, well, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. Just because you say in the name of Jesus does not make it in the name of Jesus. This concept of in the name of Jesus, I think I've talked about this before, but this is not just a, something you say. It's like the power of attorney. Like the power of attorney. You know, uh, I, I work with one of the local funeral homes here in the city. And uh, when I go to a family's house on a death call, I'm not going in my name. I'm going in the name of the funeral home. The family would not release the body to me if I'm just going in my name. If I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm Harold Miller. I can't pick you up, pick up the body. No. But if I, if I state who I'm representing, you know, I go there as their designated agent. That's what in the name of Jesus is about. It's about uh, functioning with the power of attorney. Nothing, nothing magical or mystical uh, happens when you just say the words in the name of Jesus. But that's the way a lot of people in church use it. And that's what we, uh, this thing of decreeing and declaring, same, same principle. Now, let's look at another major modern theological blunder. I've heard gospel singers and even preachers say, the Bible says, you've got to call those things that be not as though they were. Listen, my friend, that is a grave theological blunder and error. Because number one, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say we should call those things that be not as though they were. Here's what the Bible does say. It's taken from Romans chapter 4, verse 17. And I'm going to read it in the King James first because that's 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 a version a lot, a lot of people like. Uh, this is Paul writing to the church at Rome. He says, as it is written, I have, I have made thee a father of many nations. Now, this, is, this is what God is speaking about, Abram or Abraham, uh, before, whom, before him whom he believed, even God who quickened the dead. That word quickened, there's no Elizabethan uh, English word that means to make alive. It doesn't mean you quick or you fast. It means to make alive. He makes alive the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I'm going to read the text again because I hope you picked this up. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed for him, him refers to God, whom he refers to Abraham, believe even God, that qualifies who the him is, even God who quickened the dead and caused those things which be not as though they were. Let's go over to the English Standard Version. It's a little, you know, more, more modern English. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he, that is Abraham, believed, who gives life to the dead, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. As I said earlier, this, this is context. Because anytime you read anything in the Bible, context is key. That's why I always suggest to people. If you're looking at, you know, you're looking at a certain verse, you need to read several verses before there, that verse. And then you need to read several verses after that verse. That will give you, an, help you with an immediate context. Here, the Apostle Paul was discussing the faith of Abraham. As it is written, is a reference to God's covenant promise to Abram or Abraham that's recorded. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 12, and then it's repeated 
in Genesis chapter 17, where God says, Abraham, I will make you a, a you know, father of many nations. At the time God makes that declaration, makes that promise, Abraham has no child. He's childless. And he's also old. Sarah is old. Now note, if you go back to that verse, it was not Abram or Abraham, but rather it is God. It was God who caused those things that be not as though they were. Let me say it again. It was not Abraham or Abraham or Abram or Abraham. It was God. The reference is to God. God is the one who caused those things that be not as though they were. And this is a note I took. I took this is a direct quote from the um, uh, the study the, the study notes of the English of the uh, ESV study Bible. It says calls into existence things that do not exist. Underscores the doctrine of creation. Ex nihilo, ex nihilo, and that's that's the Latin for me. Out of nothing. Before God created the universe. Only God existed, nothing else. Paul used this general truth to affirm the great power of God whom Abraham trusted. Abraham believed in a God who could raise the dead and summon into existence what did not exist, referring to new life in Sarah's womb because she was, she was past the age of childbearing. So that's the context. But the, the point I want you to see is that it is God who calls those things which be not as though they were. Only God can do it. Nowhere in the text does Paul say Abraham or any believer should or even can call those things which be not as though they were. We are not God. Only God. Only God has the power of ex nihilo, nihilo. Only God can bring something out of nothing. Only God. No other creature, no, no angel, no principality, no other spiritual being, no certainly no human. Only God can call those things that be not as though they were. Only God can call things into existence that do not exist. We don't have that power. God didn't give us that. And God didn't, God will not share that Godship with us. <laughs> you know, only God can do that. That is a unique aspect of God. Now listen, notice the phrase and the word and in the phrase. Even even God who quickens the dead. He says, and cause those things which be not as though they were. It's interesting to note. See that and connects the two ideas. The same God who called those things which be not as though they were, he quickens or raises the dead. Now, I don't I don't hear anybody advocating that uh we we have the power or the ability to raise the dead. You can't have one without the other because that's the and there. So if you're gonna say, well, you know, God, the Bible says we should call those things which be not as though they were, you've got to say the Bible says we should raise the dead. Now, nobody, nobody is, is, is going, going around saying that. They said, that's ridiculous. Well, just as ridiculous is the other part of the statement because it's, it's joined with an and. You got to take both of them. Not an or, it's an and. And he's talking not about us. He's talking not about something we should do or we can do. He's saying, he's talking about something only God can do. Only God can call those things which be not as though they were. Only God can raise or give life to the dead. These are things only God can do do and to say that the bible says we should call those things which be not as though they were 
is a gross misapplication, misunderstanding of that text. Here's another one. I've heard, it, I've heard this in so many, I can't count them times I've heard this in church. Satan, I rebuke you. Or Satan, we rebuke you. You know, people are praying and people are prophesying or whatever. And they just say, Satan, I rebuke you. Satan, I rebuke you. But that's not biblical battle either. What is the word rebuke? What does that mean? Well, the Greek word, epipleso, epi so it means to strike upon, beat upon, to chastise with words, to child, to upbraid, to rebuke. So what purpose does the statement serve? Do we actually think when we say that the devil is afraid of us? Do we actually think when we say that we are affecting the devil? Does such a statement impact the devil's action? There's a passage in Jude, I think it's Jude 9, where uh, the, uh, Jude is talking about, you know, people doing things that, that they, they don't know what they're doing. They, they, it's out of the league. And he talks about when they were disputing about the body of Moses. This comes from other literature. That's not in our Bible. But he says even Michael didn't rebuke the devil. He said the Lord rebuked you. I mean, so we, we, <laughs> we, we're going places even angels don't tread. We don't have that authority. We don't have, we, nowhere in the Bible are we instructed to rebuke the devil. Now we, we are instructed to rebuke one another, to rebuke false teaching. But we're not instructed to rebuke the devil. We are, we are instructed, however, to resist the devil. If we spent the time resisting instead of trying to rebuke, we'd be better off. James 4 and 7 says, submit yourself therefore to God. Two sides of, two sides of this coin. It's not just about resisting the devil. You got to submit to God. Because if you if you don't submit to God, you're not going to be very much um, able to resist the devil. And you can't resist the devil without submitting to God. So it says, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The only way the devil will flee from us. It's not just by us merely resisting him, but we also have to submit ourselves to God. Notice the notice they go together. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil. When you do that, he will flee from you. So what does all this matter? What does all this matter? Some might think, as I said earlier, some might think that I'm just nitpicking with the topics that I discussed tonight in this lesson. However, it's important for us to be as biblically precise as possible because number one, God promised to honor his word, not our faulty interpretations of his word. Make sure when you say the Bible says, or God says, Make sure the next thing you come that comes out of your mouth, make sure it is something that has the meaning God actually intended for it to have. Make sure it's something God actually says the way he meant it to be said. Number two, the Bible is the standard uh, for faith and practice. Therefore, it is important to understand the Bible and its instructions correctly in the original context so that we may accurately translate principles applicable to our day and time. 
what I mean by that, some of the things, some of the commandments in the Bible are culturally and time specific. In other words, there are some commandments in the Bible that were only for those people in that place at that time and have absolutely no application to us. There are other commandments that are universal. They apply to all people, all places, and all time. Now, how do we know the difference? Context. Some of the things, some of the commandments in the Bible are cultural. This idea of head covering for women is a, is a prime example. You know, there's some, there's some Christian circles today who advocate that a woman should cover her head at all times or whatever, you know, but that was a cultural thing that was unique to Paul and Paul's day. Because the women who went around with their head uncovered at that time were loose women, prostitutes. Paul was literally saying, you know, you don't want to look like a floozy, cover your head. That was, that was even, even in the Middle East today, women cover their head. It's a cultural thing. So we're dealing with the word of God. It's very important that we get it right. Lest we are guilty of misrepresenting God. Let me read something to you. It's in James chapter 3, verse 1. I take this passage very, very seriously. There are a lot of people teaching that they shouldn't be teaching because they don't understand uh, the gravity of what they're doing. James says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Let not many of you become teachers. I think your King James says masters. Uh, the Greek word is didaskios, teachers. Uh, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such, we shall incur a stricter judgment. God holds those who teach his word, preachers, pastors, Sunday school teachers. God holds those people to a higher standard because they are responsible for disseminating his word to the people. And so it's imperative that we do it correctly, that we rep represent God correctly and faithfully, lest we be guilty of misrepresenting God. And so as we conclude tonight, our lead discussion is one of the many instances, this, this idea of speaking to the atmosphere, is one of the many instances where uh, theology is being shaped by so-called gospel songs. However, the theology and practice of the church should be informed should be informed and shaped by sound biblical exegesis, exegesis and not gospel song. The next time you hear a gospel song on Christian radio, don't just listen to the beat, listen to the word. Is it sound? Biblical teaching. I'll give you another one that's free, but I've, I've talked about this in, a, in, in another lesson. Uh, you know, we, we, we often talk about where, where, where the Bible says, uh, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, what great thing God has prepared. And, and there's a beautiful song, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. And the Bible does say that. But the very next verse says, Paul says, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. So when we, when we talk about eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, 
and we leave it at that. We are misrepresenting the biblical text. We're misrepresenting what God said. Yes, God does say that, but the very next verse, Paul says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. The but God says, yes, Adam, he, he has heaven heard, but we know because God has revealed them to us by his spirit. So the proper study and understanding of what the Bible says and means is as, is as important now as, uh, as it has ever been in the history of the church. Because remember back in Genesis, this whole mess started with sin because of a misunderstanding of what God said. And the devil is still doing the same thing he did with Eve. He kind of came to Eve and said, did God say that? Did God really mean that? So it's important to know what the word of God says in the context of what you said and what it means for them, people he will see said it too, and what it means for us. So I leave you with this, Jude, verse three. I have one and three, but actually there's, there's only one chapter in Jude. He says, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, in other words, I was gonna write to you about something else. But it's needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so my parting word to you, my friend, is make sure you are earnestly contending, sincerely contending, zealously contending, not the latest fad for the current, you know, popular, popular thing, but the faith that was once delivered, historical, true, biblical faith. And our faith in that word and what God has done. It is our faith in that revelation that will lead us to life. Well, God bless you, my friend. I hope this study has been beneficial to you. Hope I've shared some insight that will help you in your walk with the Lord. And as I said earlier, if this blessing, if this video has been a blessing to you, it will be a blessing to someone else. Share it on your timeline. It's important that we all mature and grow strong in the faith so that we won't be misinformed and saying nonsensical and non biblical things like speaking into the atmosphere and decreeing and declaring uh, and think that those are actually valid biblical principles. Well, God bless you. Until next time, may the Lord bless you real good is our prayer. And may the Lord be with you forevermore is also our prayer. Have a good